we're live. Yep, we're live. Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, Zone Committee meeting. We've got quite a few people coming on live stream team talk. Hopefully, um, hopefully you're getting the message all right, you guys. James, you can hear me? Good stuff. So, um, David, if you do the current here, please. Fakataka te ho ki te uru, Fakataka te ho ki te tonga, ki a ma kine kine ki uta, ki a ma taratara ki tai, e hi akiana te atikura, he tio, he huka, he ho hu, ti he mauri oa. Thank you, Dave. Um, we got any apologies? Uh, yes, we have uh, Arapata Rubin and Claire Buchanan. I've got an apology for lateness from Chris Allen, who's not far away. Uh, I think everyone else is here. So I move. Um, David, I'm going to be leaving at 2.45, that's okay. 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 So I'll move those apologies to be accepted or in favour? Aye. Aye. Okay, thanks. Um, ex any extraordinary business coming up that we haven't got at the moment or we don't know about or from the floor? No, nothing there. That's good. Um, as always, register of interest we discuss, which is in the front of your uh, board paper, and you have to, it's your responsibility to update Carol with that. So the minutes from the last meeting, which is a while ago, because we had the, um, I have a cup of tea that's got my mask off. <laughs> uh, the uh, the last minute sort of wee while ago because that's two meetings because we had the field trips since um, if I got someone to move there confirm them as an accurate record thank you Stuart a seconder yeah. thank you Jen uh, any comments arising from the minutes that aren't coming up or anything you want to discuss just a wee um, correction on point six on the correspondence of Miss Canterbury Captain selection rather than collective Okay. Just a smell of spelling, possibly. Okay. All right, well, I'll move those minutes uh, past. We have a seconder for that. Oh, we did that, didn't we, Stu? So all, all in favour, please say aye. 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 Carry. Aye. Dave, what's next? Correspondence. Uh, it's no correspondence. No correspondence. Uh, then we're going public contribution. So is anyone from the public... Wish to say, speak now or forever or talk later? <laughs> no, that's good. All right, so you're more than welcome to participate. And I think there's a bit of public on the Microsoft too, so we'll keep an eye out for you and uh, you're welcome to ask a question. What's next, Dave? And then we're on to Otifari Kai update from Jude or Galay. Jude's. Jude's here, really. You're uh... Okay. Okay, Jude, you... it's all. You're on. Can you hear me all right in the room? Yes, we can. Yep. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Look, um, tēnā koutou katoa, and um, it's a great pleasure that I'm finally able to present to you this overview of O2 Farakai, so an update of all the work that's happening um, out of the working group. Um, we had intended to get this to you a bit earlier for a previous meeting, but we, um, various people across the agencies all, um, as has been happening lately, um, been taken out with illness. So we've got here now, and the intention is that this will be every two months that we'll have a bit of a rolling rhythm of providing this update. So um, I attached a little cover sheet to that, um, and I guess just wanted to recap on the main purpose of this update was um, to give you all as zone committee representatives, but also um, use this update as a mechanism for giving some visibility around the range of work underway that's addressing the declining water quality and ecosystem values in O2 Farakai. Um, in producing this update, there is a balance between producing something to give some visibility, but recognising at times people might want to find out more about a specific work program or work stream. So the opportunity for the Zone Committee is to make that request from that lead agency via myself or um, Ruben and our team or through Dave, to, and we can organise that more, more detailed presentation to come to a, a zone committee meeting because it's to provide a really detailed report is just going to be too work extensive and we'll be taking our eye off the delivery and that catchment. So I guess it's just managing managing that tension. Um, 
This first one was a little bit tricky because it was a little bit of how much do you already know about some of these work programs. There's a mixture of what some agencies would have as their business as usual work, and then there's been some additional work put on. So I just wanted to um, make that offer for more information if you want it on a particular work stream, um, and there might be benefit of having a um, different agencies coming in at different times to talk about what they are doing as part of that catchment. But hopefully you can appreciate um, the, the having a little bit more visibility of that rain, range of work. Um, and we spent a bit of time at the start of that report that just runs through who's involved in the actual, actual working group. What is exciting as well is that we've actually got our website live for O2 Farakai. So I've put it in the chat. I'm about to press send on it. And hopefully we can, the technology will work and we can take you to the website. Though I don't know, I've not shared my screen. Let me try that, sorry. You'd think after all this time, I'd be a bit more masterful at the steps required. Can you see the website image? Yeah. Yep. So this is sitting on eCare Environment Canterbury's main website. So what this intention here is that we will use this as a holding place for information that's happening in O2 Farakai, both what Environment Canterbury is doing, but also the working group. And within that, we'll be just continually updating it to be able to put links to any other reports that have come out from um, work um, that's happened, links to other websites from the different agencies. So I just wanted to show you, so that sh is now live for anyone in our community um, to be able to access. So for example, um, sorry, sort of the scrolling will make somebody nauseous, so I apologise for that. We've got a little description of the working group. We've got the fact that the Ashburton Zone Water Zone Committee Action Plan has this as a priority area. Um, as well, so there's information there, and then this update sits in, is, is all um, posted up on there as well, and would be in the in the future. So again, that's about giving much greater visibility about the range of work and accessibility to that information of the range of work happening in the catchment. Um, I wasn't going to go through the action plans. I mean, the action underway. I figured to took it as read, but I'm happy to answer any questions. It's a, it's a good report, there's plenty in it. So we'll just have a look. Is there, have we got yeah, any questions yeah. coming out straight away? Just one question, Bill. The, the monitoring that's been happening so far, what's it telling us in the early yeah. stages? So um, the monitoring from this past summer season um, has shown that for, and it varies with each of the water bodies, and actually at the next zone committee, I think we're scared, did we wire it in, Dave, to get a presentation of the water quality results? Yes. Yeah, so, so you, at the next meeting you'll get the detail. But for um, Lake Clearwater, which of course was the, the, um, the initial water body with the greatest concern, has shown some improvement this summer from where it was, not out of the woods yet, because it's a trend. Um, but Lake Huron in particular has shown a bit further decline. So there'll be more info at that at the next zone committee meeting, and our science guys will be talking to that, and I think along with the Department of Conservation's water monitoring results, because they monitor some of those high country streams, um, and they will be able to answer detailed questions at that point. I'm not a water quality scientist, so. So Chris, have you got a question? Yeah, um, Judith, I probably asked the question before, where does the zone committee sit within the process? So one of our priorities is the whole area. Yep. What do we do? Where do we sit into it? Everyone else is doing everything else. So what do we do? Well, I think I think that's a it's a good question, and I think there's two two avenues for that. Um, one is um, the working groups composed of the the people and agency who can make actual change on the ground by the work they're doing. Okay, so that's currently um, the. 
those, those members. So it's about the fact that they can influence what, what improvements can be made on the ground. The bit that we're really conscious of, and one of the reasons for doing this update on the website, was the broader engagement about what's happening in Otu Whareakai and what are we doing about it. And I think that's a really critical role that the zone could committee forum has, so hence why I think you holding this update is, is a great place for, for that, um, and looking at what are, those what are those other engagement opportunities that might be needed. One of the things is the working group is looking at that degradation, the, the broader than water quality, it's interested in the other values that are associated out there as well, and it might be one of the issues that we did um, Department of Conservation, Ashburton District Council and ECAN did sit around the table to try and get a grip on was the inappropriate use of four-wheel drive. It's a really big problem. It's a gnarly issue to nail as far as catching people and being able to enforce it. But that, that champion the messaging about what is appropriate or not, that real education and advocacy would be another opportunity that the Zone Committee could hold, I think. Yep. Okay, and just a, another question. There's some really good graphs in here, and it's got trending populations of birds. Now, when we're looking at uh, paradise ducks and Canadian geese, do we want the trend to go down? Do we want it to be stable, or do we want it to be improving? And I think that would depend on your perspective and what you value in that environment, because some people would want a growing population, and others would, because they compete with um, the habitat for livestock, for example, would want to see the trend different. That's a you know a complex resource management issue. We just thought um, fishing game went to the trouble of producing those graphs a bit more detail, so we just thought we'd include them in this report. So it's an example of a, a bit more detail, but depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer to that. Yeah, and it's just yeah. all about context, and that's all very well looking mm. at a snapshot, but actually yeah. we've seen massive imp um, increases in paradise ducks on our place. So yeah. if they're not up there, where have they gone to? And I mm. think we've got a lot of ponds, so it might not all be bad for the area, but actually it might be just a snapshot where you're looking at the time. Yeah, yeah. Judith, I've just got a question on the membership of the working group. Yes. Um, you've listed, I think on page seven, basically the organisations that are representative. Or yep. on the, so I, I don't know who these people are representing these organisations. I don't know who's representing ADC or ECAN, whether it's councillors or staff. And the other, can... the, the other point I'd have is that, you know, there's a farming community up there, there's a lakeholders community up there, there's people with recreational interest. And in the past, you know, even back to 2016, the Zone Committee had quite a part to play on that because it could relate to both groups and its elected representatives, but we seem to have been cut out of that. Um, as, can you explain that, please? Yeah, look, so I moved into my my role here of, of, of kind of um, being an ECAN lead in connecting the working group. Um, we put some project management support around around that. Um, and I just stepped into this last year, about this time last year. So, so I just caught up with Nick, actually, to ask the sort of plotted history. But I think one of the reasons we, we deliberately didn't put membership names into the working group because... When we, we did this as a in collaboration with the working group members, they felt it was more important to see the agencies represented than it was the individual. But the membership of this working group from those agencies is very much more operational staff, um, for an, as, as, an, as an example. So, um, so, so each of the four farms ha are invited to attend and participate, and some do and some don't. It varies depending on what else is happening, when the meetings are, et cetera. Um, Ashburton, we've got Ian Hyde, for example, who, who sits in that Ashburton District Council space. Um, several different people from DOC, um, Tom and someone else, I can't remember their name offhand. So it's more operational staff. Um, one of the things that has happened in more recent times, um, so the working group started, came in together around 2019. Um, to really just connect on what's all the work underway and what what needs to happen, and it was a you you'll know some of you will know this history better than I did um, around the information the Department of Conservation presented around their concern of declining water quality, and um, what what could be done about it. So the working group worked in a variety of ways, but it, um, about this time last year, Environment Canterbury and the Runanga, particularly led by the chair um, at the time of Ara Whenua, John Henry, 
we're in engagements about the need to to elevate and uh, um, um, elevate the conversation from working group members, very operational, to higher officials within Crown agencies in order to get a mandate about what those agencies were going to do and therefore enable their staff to do. Because it affects changes in budgets and all those sorts of things for those, those Crown agencies. So that led to a uh, mana to mana hui that was held on the 3rd of November, which had, had um, for example, the um, um, the director of Tamanaroti Wai from MFE attending, but also, um, sorry, I'm trying to think, um, Craig Harris is um, Crown Lands. So, so, so it was quite a very high level level meeting. So that's happened since, and that was about expediating action, um, given that sometimes the bucket you've got to manage with is 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 the limiting factor on what pe what agencies can deliver. So that started, and that, that group's met twice now. So they met November last year and then now um, just last month. But that was to come as a commitment from Crown agencies to Runanga around improving the water quality of that in, in the O2 Whārakai. Okay, thank you. And just so who do you report to um, when you have results, because I, I, you're getting an on time or in real time data and all those sort of things, you're getting plenty of information. Who does that get sent to? Um, so, so we get information. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is real time. We tend to do a, you know, some of that water quality is real time, but we get it. It gets bunched and QA'd, quality assurance, and then and then presented in chunks. I know that for environment, the work environment Canterbury does in that space gets fed through to our councillors, and obviously will be part of the conversation at the next zone committee meeting, when the, with, as part of that presentation through. Okay. Is that what you meant? There's, yeah, basically, I'm asking: Is the zone committee going to be kept up to date? with the results of these tests and things, and your, your, your reply is yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yep, yes that's yep. good. So, uh, and that's the other thing about, you'll get that much more, if you see this kind of update happening every two months, you'll get that yeah. and, and invite those other agencies to come and talk about what they're doing. I think we'll much improve that, that connection and understanding and therefore see your opportunity of the role you could play much more clearly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other guy? Jen's got a question for you, Judith. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had questions earlier on regarding the hut holders and yeah. whether there's a representative from there in that group now or. No, there there isn't at the moment, and I mentioned before that one of the reasons um, one of the reasons for that was um, some of the work around the the people that can make a difference on the ground. Now, to date, it was Ashburton District Council representing the hut holders as the landowner that was requiring the action. So I guess the decommissioning of the long drops is an example that that of of work that's happened in that space. I think we're at a point where we can look at now. At, at expanding the working group slightly broader, but at the same time, we'll also have to have kind of another, um, the Crown agencies will need to connect on some things to feed through to those official groups, that, that mana to mana group. So, so we're in a bit of a, um, so coming up, the working group's meeting on the 15th of August in Methvin, it'll be our first face-to-face -face in over a year, um, just to connect, and that's part of the exploring we're doing about, because we're really interested in how do we improve um, visibility and connection with other stakeholders apart from, you know, this sort of current membership. So how do we go wider and what does that need to look like? So I think that's part of the, I guess, just continually revisiting things. Oh, Ian, have you got a question? Well, more a comment. Yeah. More a comment than anything else, Judith. Um, the, the, the hut holders up there uh, put forward a nomination to either a liaise with the zone committee or the working party uh, because they believe that they, if, uh, from an operational point of view, they had some significant benefit that they could bring. Uh, and that request has been so far ignored, ignored by uh, ECAN and by uh, the, the, the Otafarakai Working Party, which I think is a pity. 
so not been ignored. It has been discussed amongst the working group, and at that point, it felt the time wasn't quite right. I think at this upcoming meeting, face to face, that's the part I want to progress. That Ian. Thanks. Uh, oh, that, that's Neil. You haven't got a question. That's just your line. Is it? Oh, sorry. No. That's all right. So Dave, have you got a question at the back there? John, sorry. <laughs> we can maybe we've got to come up and press her because I won't hear you on, on the teams. So it's John from Doc. Just to introduce you, they probably all know who you are. But. Right. Yeah, hi, uh, John Ben from the Department of Conservation in Christchurch. Um, just one more important bit of work that what's not mentioned on that, perhaps because it's not an official agency, but besides um, Fish and Games Annual Bird Counts, Forest and Bird, along with DOC, do an annual winter bird survey at Odeforica, and that was done just this weekend. And that's one of the longest, if not the longest, continuous bird survey in the country. It's been going for over 30 years, and that, that data is available, so you'll be able to get your paradise duck trends. <laughs> okay, cheers, so just alerting you to that, to that bit of work. Um, no, I was just talking to one of the people on the dock in Christchurch who was on it on the weekend that they count everything they see. And that, that's an on the ground survey, it's not helicopters like uh, f Fish and Game on. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Judith, thanks for that. Uh, you're doing well. As you say, you've been in the role for not a long time, and it's quite a big role you've got because there's you know, some issues there. And, and I think. As a zone committee, we've tried hard to sort of work in with the different groups and try and make it as pleasant a process as possible. So I hope you'll keep that in mind when you're going yep. forward. But thank you for your time. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David. So it's our friend Bianca, is it? Yes, Bianca. Um, Henry's an apology. He's unwell. Yeah. Um, we have Bianca and Janine. Uh... Oh, sorry. No. sorry. Yes, Henry's an apology because he's unwell, but we have Bianca and Janine online here now for this um, so presentation. This is the Ashburn Consent Review, everyone. So, Bianca, I can't see you, but I suppose you're there. Yes, yes. Where's she? Oh, g'day. Okay, Bianca, so we've got your report, so it's all yours, please. Right, kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, as, as Dave said, apologies from um, Henry. Um, yeah, I was quite glad to stay home in the rain. We were going to come down today, but uh, yeah, th things are a bit wet. Um, we've got a presentation which um, I will just, with any luck, share my screen. Can you see that? Something bizarre has happened. Nothing no? Okay, hang on a moment. Here we go. Yep. Yes. How's that? Good, thanks. So it's been a few months, well, it's been quite a while actually, since since we gave you an update on what's happening with the consent reviews. And, and, and some of you who have been on the Zone Committee for a while will remember, um, you know, the, the reasonably in-depth workshops that we had leading up to the consent reviews um, and we were really really grateful for, for the for the input that, that the zone committee provided to the process um, the reviews have been going for a wee while now so just to let you know where things were at um, so just as a little bit of background the the land and water regional plan the sub regional ch chapter fresh version came operative in 2016, and there, these consent reviews were initiated in 2019. So the reviews are to implement the minimum flows for the Ashburton River uh, and tributaries, so for the Hakateri catchment, that take effect from the 1st of July 2023. So we'd thought sort of initiating those reviews in 2019 gives consent holders a bit of time to make that adjustment um, before before the new minimum flows kick in in 2023. So so it includes a six cubic minimum flow for State Highway 1 uh, and then minimum flows for the tributaries as well. So you may recall that there's also a minimum flow of 10 cubics in the plan 
uh, that takes effect from 1st of July 2033. We, we made a, a pretty conscious decision not to include that in this review. The plan will be re revised prior to 2033, um, and we did have quite a few concerns about that 10 cubic number being <laughs> reasonably high. Um, so the reviews target just the minimum flows and also the flow recorder and telemetry conditions as well. So just a couple more slides from me before I hand over to Janine, who's going to step through sort of what what we're likely to see from, from the reviews. Just benefits and impacts. Benefits to start with. A lot of these are written, are included in the ZIP and one of the key reasons for the higher minimum flow in the plan was to keep the river, at, river mouth open more frequently and for longer periods as well. The reviews um, or the minimum flows will also help restore the natural character and the of the of the waterways, um, particularly the, the, the spring feed streams. So we're also, um, and I'll get into this on the next slide, but there is an equity issue too if we had consent holders moving to to the new plan minimum flow at different times. There would be quite a lot of equity issues there. In terms of the impacts, and, and, and some of you I know have been directly involved here, there, ha there are some pretty significant impacts on some consent holders. The reduction in the number of days they can irrigate is going to be quite severe for some. And I think one thing that we've really, or well, that ECAN has learnt from this process too, is that you can do an economic assessment as part of a plan as to what the impacts of minimum flows would likely be, but it's not until you get down and discuss with consent holders, with farmers on the ground, that you can really understand those impacts. And they do vary greatly from farm to farm. And that's something that, that we've under that we understand a lot better now and that has been feeding into the plan process for this next plan and the way that they're doing economic assessments to try and get a better understanding of what the impacts would likely to be of, of certain measures. So uh, in terms of the other impacts, there were quite a few consent holders who are taking connected, hydraulically connected groundwater who didn't have minimum flows currently. So the effects are going to be greater for them than for people who are shifting, uh, say, from a three and a half cubic minimum flow up to the six cubic minimum flow. Some are going from no minimum flow to six, which is quite a big jump, particularly when their investment was was made on having no minimum flow. The other thing, the plan does provide for swaps to deep groundwater, uh, provides an allocation for people who who have a, either a surface water take or a hydraulically connected groundwater take to get to access to deeper groundwater. Um, but a lot of consent holders can't. There's there's not deep groundwater available in all parts of the catchment. Um, also, irrigation schemes, um, uh, BCI were trying to to hook some consent holders up, but that that fell over as well. So, so there are issues accessing alternative water for those who are going to be quite severely impacted. So I've covered some of this, but the. The rationale for the reviews, just to recap, a lot of the consents aren't due for renewal for quite a number of years, and I think the longest ones were somewhere around like 2041, so quite a ways to go. So the river wouldn't see the benefits of the plan minimum flows until all of the consents, or at least the vast majority, are on those plan minimum flows. And in the interim, those who, who moved to the plan minimum flow first would end up having less reliability, while the remainder would just end up with improved reliability without any any benefit to the river, if that makes sense. So there is a real equity issue, as well as not really realising the benefits to the river until all consent holders are on that plan minimum flow together. So without doing the reviews, that there would have been those as issues. So where are we at with the reviews? 88 uh, were consents were reviewed. Um, so that that was 50 hydraulically connected groundwater takes, 36 surface water takes. So currently 71 of those 88 have been resolved. So that's either 
uh, granted with the minimum flows. So we've got 62 that have gone through with the new minimum flow. Six have been declined. Um, and while declined sounds, I suppose, um, you know, for a, if you're applying for a consent application and your consent application's de declined, it doesn't sound like a good thing. Uh, for a consent review, if it's declined in this instance, it means that those consent reviews have gone through without the new minimum flow being being added to the consent. So there's various reasons for that. Either the consent holder has changed their their rates or volumes of take, uh, and for groundwater takes, that in some instances has meant that they're no not longer hydraulically connected, so they don't need a minimum flow anymore. Uh, others uh, have uh, done done pump tests and showed that actually there's that there's no there's no hydraulic connection there, which again means they don't need the minimum flow. So so we've ended up um, yeah with six dropping out of the review process, uh, and three at this stage have been surrendered. So those consents um, either. I think one of them was someone who realised, well, they had the consent sitting there, but they didn't need it. There was also another couple who have, who have shifted to deep groundwater uh, and, and have surrendered their surface water takes. So there's currently three consent reviews publicly notified. So they're belonging to um, uh, Valletta Holdings and Green Street Irrigation Scheme. So that publicly notified period closes next Friday if anybody's interested in submitting. Um, and then there's 14 consent reviews on hold and they're belonging to eight consent holders. Now those ones are the ones, well, it's not to say that some of the ones that have been resolved didn't have significant issues, but of the ones that are remaining, they, they do have significant issues and they're looking at options and they do have limited options. So we're trying to work with them as much as they can, as, as we can at this stage. Um, over to Janine for comments on some of the where some of the science is at. Yeah, I thought so. Um, for those of you who know don't know me, uh, I'm Janine Topeden. I'm a service water scientist at Environment Canterbury, and I've been involved um, with the Ashburton Hakateri uh, Consents Review uh, probably since July June 2019. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to provide a bit of an update, um, hopefully letting you know what we're likely to see uh, in terms of service flows uh, throughout the catchment. Um, important to note is that, yeah, we will only be able to, to know what the actual benefits are from July 2023 onwards, um, because that's when the new minimum flow regime kicks in, uh, and then most likely, um, we will only be seeing real benefits from the start of the irrigation season, so September, October onwards. Um, and then um, because the ecosystem will have to adjust to the new minimum flow as well, um, groundwater and hydrology will need to find a new way to interact to each other in a new equilibrium. So, um, yeah, the likely changes we will see maybe December 2023, uh, some, somewhere around there. Uh, and of course, the farm practices will will adapt further. Um, they're now in line with the plan, but a lot of them have had to made, make uh, significant changes to how they're actually going to irrigate on farm. Um, and they will most likely be adapting um, further over time. Um, so, yeah, what, what have we used then to um, to show the likely benefits from um, this minimum flow uh, regime uh, and, and, and getting the consents in line with that? Um, we've used um, uh, the results from a water availability assessment that was carried out in, in July 2019. Can you show the next slide, Bianca? Is that all right? Sorry, I'm not driving. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, which was a, a daily water budget model. model. Uh, in there, we uh, used all the available water data that we had um, and actual water use data. Um, and we compared basically what the um, current minimum flow conditions were on each uh, existing consent. Um, and what they would be after 
um, the consent review and then um, looked at what the flows would be under those two scenarios. Um, and it's important to note that that will only show a relative change um, in the surface flows, but also in the water availability because things are different on the ground um, because surface water and groundwater interaction will change um, uh, depending on what people are doing. Um, also, farm practices will change um, because of the new minimum flow regime. But yeah, assumptions that we made were that everything would stay the same other than the minimum flow regime. So it's it's purely a what would you be seeing now compared to what could you be seeing in the future if everyone shifted to the new minimum flow regime. Um, and as Bianca has said, the majority, the far, far majority of the consent holders have now got conditions that are in line with the plan. So we're quite um, comfortable with the results that they are quite likely going to show what the relative difference will be um, in terms of surface water flows and water availability throughout the catchment. Um, so we've got a bit more confidence in the outputs uh, now than we had back then. Um, and of course, there will be uncertainties around the modelling um, because, yeah, we still don't know what the last few consents um, will do um, that are still in progress and how they will be decided. Uh, climate will impact on flows and demand also even further. Um, ADC is, is going to further reduce the stock water uh, takes and, and how are they going to achieve it? Where in the catchment are they going to do it and how will that affect the flows as well? Um, demand will change um, as land use will change. So there's a lot that will change over time, but this is purely to demonstrate what if people were still doing the same thing on the ground today um, or in the future as, as, as they are today. Um, so then what changes are can we expect in the river? I've put some model outputs up. Um, this is what um, the yellowish is the flow uh, left at State Highway 1 um, or what we would likely be seeing at State Highway 1 if the new minimum flow regime is in place and the blue is under the current regime. So you'll, you'll see some yo-yoing um, going up and down around the six QMEX. Um, if you look at the December period, for example, there's some, some spikes in there. Uh, that's most likely because of the way it's been modelled. People will will adjust to to this, and they'll they'll highly likely reduce that takes before it actually gets to their minimum flow, so that they can continue taking instead of actually being fully turned off and then turned on again because flow jump up. So that will likely be a slightly smoother line. But what you can see is that even in a wetter year, because 2017 and 2018 is classed as a bit of a wetter with a summer, um, there are still benefits um, in there, especially when the flows are in the, say, 10 QMEX to, to 4 QMEX range, uh, the flows will remain higher for longer, um, which will also uh, benefit uh, the Hyperua uh, further downstream. Um, then it's important to note that flows will fall below the six QMEX naturally, just because there's not enough water in the system. So the minimum flow regime is not going to never get the flows at State Highway 1 below six QMEX. Um, if we then look at a really dry year, and we've taken 2015 and 16 as, a, uh, as an example, um, you'll, the benefits are greater there, just because the flows were so low. Um, and, and more in, in the range of the four to 10 QMEX. So you'll have larger benefits. You'll see the yellow line, again, that yo-yoing again, which is not likely to, to continue going on in the future. Um, but yeah, flows are much longer above the six QMEX than we're currently seeing, um, which is definitely a, a benefit there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then overall, more water is left in the system. So we'll have increased surface flow and um, connected uh, groundwater levels. 
Uh, there's going to be an increase in time that the river will spend above the six cubics at State Highway 1. Um, and because there's not a lot of losses happening between State Highway 1 and the coast, we're expecting that the State Highway 1 flows are, are representative of what's going to happen at the Harpo as well, at the mouth. Um, and yeah, again, although the river will still naturally fall below that six cumex uh, under dry climate uh, conditions. Um, what I can say though is that um, the model might be underestimating the benefits a little bit because we now know that some of the concerns that were initially um, represented in this modeling as um, going to be in line with the minimum flow regime have since either transferred to deep groundwater or they have surrendered their takes. So there's uh, roughly about um, 800 litres to a cumic um, is, is not taken out of the system uh, after 2023. So that will further um, enhance the flows in the system or further enhance the groundwater levels um, throughout the catchment. And I think, yeah, it's over to you, Bianca. So next steps, um, so we're continuing to work with those consent holders who have still got um, reviews in process. That includes a number of consents to it's consent applications and process where people are wanting to swap to deep groundwater where we're working with the consent section as well, just to make sure um, make sure that those consent applications are prioritised and, and, and managed well. Uh, we are aiming to have all the consent reviews decided by the 1st of July 2023. So those consent reviews that are still in process, we are starting to put a, a bit more pressure on now for those consent holders to, um, to either propose an alternative minimum flow or to start um, or, or to accept the, the plan minimum flow, given if anybody was to appeal uh, the review that would take time as well, that we wouldn't then have, have them all determined by 1st of July 2023. Um, the other, I suppose the other sort of key work that we're doing at the moment is those applications that have been notified. Um, those ones need, need a bit more work from Environment Canterbury. Uh, and we're looking at this stage that those hearings would probably be late October, early November at this stage. So ideally, again, those consent holders would have their decisions out before Christmas. That's what we're hoping anyway. So so they've got an, got a good period of time before the next um before the next irrigation season to 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 work out what they're going to do depending on on what that decision is. So that's um that's all we had in terms of presentation. Has anyone got any questions? I'll oh, just wait for a second because Sydney had hers up and down. So, yeah. Sydney, you, you fire ahead with your question. Hello. Hi, Sydney here. Um, I just have a question. You said that the, um, what you can see in the future is nothing much changing. Um, I just want to, to find out if you had to consider what would be the recharge to groundwater when this uh, flow, you know, comes to to what you were expecting to to be in the future. Have you uh, looked into that at all? I think you mentioned something, but um, what I understood is that you predict that will be the same, the recharge will continue to be the same, even though you have more water into the, the system. Um, I think if I understand your question, uh, is that... So basically, like, what do you expect to happen with the river recharging the groundwater? Do you expect to have a higher recharge because now you have more water? Or do you expect to have less because the volume over is more, so you have a faster flow? Have you um, looked into that at all? Uh, we have. It's just... Um, that it will depend on where we are in the system because some of the um, tributaries um, 
are heavily reliant on groundwater. Uh, so the stream for extremes, they, they are heavily reliant on, on groundwater popping back up. So if we are reducing the stress on those, they will be un under pressure less and therefore the surface flow in those streams will, will go up. Um, if we uh, look at the North Branch, for example, that loses a lot of water um, to groundwater. So if we have more water in the system, the surrounding groundwater levels will be higher, uh, meaning that there will be the loss rate is likely to reduce. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, mm. system. So I can't quantify them, which is why we haven't tried to do that. And I've tried to stay as high level as it, as basically if we leave more water in the system being at surface water or groundwater, the ecosystem as a whole will benefit and it could either be groundwater levels in some areas, it could be surface water flow in others, or it could be a combination of both. Um, so yes, there will be the loss rates loss rates will likely be less um, as a result. Um, the, the main benefit of um, loss rates reducing and surface flows uh, continuing on for longer. So so it's not going to exacerbate uh, river reaches drying, for example. It, does that help a little? Or? Yeah, it does, does help a little. I'm just trying to understand um, what would happen to, the, yeah, like you said, the groundwater level and um, the conditions of their groundwater. If there is more recharge, then looking at reduction of any potential pollutants there, but if we're looking at less recharge. So that will be interesting to, to see, to find out. Yeah, sorry, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. And and what I'd like to note there, though, is, is that there's a lag time there too. So the shallow groundwater will re react quicker, the deeper groundwater, not so much. Um, and because the... Minimum flow regime is, is is mainly targeted around periods of low flow, not the overall uh, uh, allocation as a whole, um, which is where the surrendering and the swapping to deep groundwater becomes more important um, mm. because we're yeah. taking less less water out of the system as a whole, which I think in that case becomes more important if we look at the water balance as a whole, whereas if we look at the shallow groundwater and the surface flows, uh, the minimum flow regime benefits are, um, are more likely to be apparent there. Um, yeah. So, so it's a it's a very dual system, very complicated. Um, and I think the deep groundwater has been depleted a lot. So it's going to take a, quite a while for this new equilibrium to 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 take shape. So, yeah, it's going to be a transition period for for quite some time. Okay, there's a question from James Vega. Well, kia ora, Bianca and Jenny. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I just have one question. I have a legal background and I just had a question about viability of consents, which you may or may not be in a position to answer. Um, I understand that ECAN's position is that a consent remains viable, and this is uh, in relation to some of the publicly notified consents, that it remains viable as long as water can still be taken under the consent. And it doesn't take into account uh, the viability of the perhaps farming operation or the commercial operation. Are you able to give some insight as to what, why ECAN has that position? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose in short, um, we've relied quite heavily on the council's legal advisors, Wynne Williams, for advice around, around, you know, what the RMA is referring to around the viability of the consented activity, and it is a matter, and this is from memory, not not looking back at 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 the, at the act. It's a matter that the council has to have regard to. So we're well aware that the review can't have the effect of cancelling the consent, and so our legal advice is if if a consent holder is still able to take water. To, to for irrigation, um, there's always there's an effect on the viability of the consented activity through not being able to do that uh, as as much as perhaps was anticipated. But um, yeah, they're saying as long as that's still able to occur, the activity is still viable. And it, it's it's been quite difficult with this process from a legal perspective. There's not a lot of case law. 
and and that's something that that we have uh, you know we've, we've struggled with and we've, we've relied quite heavily on on the council's legal legal advisors they've, they've had quite a lot of questions thrown at them mm. yeah i guess my i think view on this would be that although a consent may not be cancelled in, in the sense of it no longer being viable would it not be in effect essentially cancelled if the if the purpose for which the consent is provided is no longer able to be undertaken I wonder whether that's mm. that would that would be an interpretation of it, which I think could possibly be considered. Yeah, and that may be the interpretation of whether the consent's cancelled or not. And I know the advice we've had around sort of what constitutes cancellation versus an impact on viability is, yeah, it's it's reasonably complex. And I, I know it's discussed also. I don't know if you've seen the um, Mr. and Mrs. Galloway's consent yeah. went to. Um, yeah, went to, went to a hearing and Ben Williams appeared for the Galloways and there was there was quite a quite a discussion around around those points. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, Ian, did you have a question? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bianca, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, uh, Janine, I mean, sorry, or both of you. <laughs> this question is for you, Janine. Uh, have you assessed? You, you mentioned closing down further stock water races. Have you effect? Have you assessed the effect that that's going to have on biodiversity values and uh, in-stream values in streams that are associated with the stock water system, where the stock water system uh, races tail off into, namely, mainly a lot of the spring-fed drains to the south side of the Ashburton River, which aren't part of the Ashburton River catchment, because if you because there's um, the, the zone committee and its zip um, had as one of its high priorities was to restore the health of the, of the uh, spring fed drains. Uh, a lot of those relied on stock water race water um, f for their continuous flow. And as, you, as the district council closes down the stock water race system, uh, a lot of those drains are drying up. So, so in terms of your overall um, assessment of the benefits of increasing flows in the Ashburton River, have you counted in the, um, the adverse effect you're having uh, by closing down the stock water race system and therefore a lot of the flows in the uh, Ashburton Hines drainage system? Um, I haven't because in the modelling I did, I assumed that everyone was going to carry on as they were. So the results that I've modelled do not account for any stock water closure um, at all. Um, I know we've had some discussions in the uh, water quality team, so for me it's purely a quantity side of things. Um, and I think there it becomes more of a what value, what do we value more? Um, and, and it's a tricky one, um, but yeah, in short, in, in my in the water quantity assessment, I haven't, because I had assumed that no closures were to happen, uh, because we couldn't anticipate um, or, or preempt what um, ABC might be doing and where they might be doing what. I'm going to. And wait. we will be. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just going to a quick supplementary to that question because when this whole consent review process was started, as Bianca said, 2016, 17, 19, one of the key parts of it was that stock water closures would have an effect on the water that was the start of the river. So are you now saying you're not even including that at all? I haven't done that in this one, no. Oh, that's uh, that's because, interesting. Uh, because what I've assessed was the effect of the minimum flow regime and ADC was not going to be subject to uh, the July 2023 minimum flows. So as a result of the implementation of the uh, minimum flow regime, nothing changes for them. Not, not for them, but it does for the river. Um, yeah, Ian? Um, I, well, yes, but that's not, not related to the minimum flow regime, though. If they were to, to close their stockwater races, um, that's not... Uh, part of the consent review process. Uh, this, uh, um, I, I understood that. Uh, <coughs> I understood that the uh, there was a requirement for the district council to close down the stock water races to meet the to meet the flow regimes required for the 2023 plan. 
Uh, and in fact, that there has been instructions to ADC to consider closing down the Brothers intake off the Ashburn race, uh, off the Ashburn River specifically for that purpose. Yeah, yeah. we've we've had a few. Well, we've had conversations with ADC re reasonably recently, just trying to get an understanding of how much they're taking for the stockwater races. Uh, in the ZIP and also that tra follow through into the land and water regional plan, there's a there's a policy in there that, that specifies a, a maximum amount that should be taken out of the system for stock water. Um, we're reasonably comfortable from the information that ADC have provided us that, that the stock water race abstractions are below that uh, and reasonably well below that. But I know ADC are still planning to continue some stock water race closures and there's a local government act process that they need to go through for those closures where they'll be looking at a range of issues including the biodiversity values but um but my understanding is that it's not solely uh this process that driving those closures there's a, there's a lot of other considerations adc have as well uh there's it seems there's not the same uptake and, and, and there's probably others in the room who know more about this than me, but I know fish screens are, are quite a, a big issue as well. That those stockwater races don't have um, don't have compliant fish screens at the moment. Chris, you have a question. I've got to declare my conflict, and I'm sure I'll get a conflict, uh, and it makes it and Bill will pull me up. Um, thanks, Bianca, and thanks, Janine. Um, We've got a river now of two halves. We've got a minimum flow at State Highway 1 and we've got another minimum flow at the RDR. You, Janine, you showed the reliability at State Highway 1. What does it do at the RDR? Because they get first crack at the water. So I'm coming back to we've got a planning process that picks some winners. And I'm just wondering what does the hydrology look like with after the consents review? for the reliability at the RDR take, because effectively that's the minimum flow site that drives the whole catchment from here on in. And then I've got another question. Um, I, ooh, I'd have to look. For, have you got the water availability assessment, Bianca, somewhere? Because they'll be in there. Um, the, the, the report? Yep. So this is showing the residual flows at State Highway 1 because that's the bottom end of the catchment. And uh, what these flows are showing is when RDR is implementing their own minimum flows. So it is um, the end result of everyone sticking to their minimum flow at State Highway 1 or on the tributary. And for the RDR, uh, it's the... Um, they're only subject to their residual flow downstream of their intake. Um, so their reliability is, is, is higher than of some of the others. Um, but yeah, that's what was in the plan, so that's how it's modelled. Um, in saying that the State Highway 1 uh, water availability and residual flows are including everyone's minimum flow um, conditions after 2023. So the changes to RDR will also be in there. So in the plan, there's also a part then around water user group. So does the plan actually enable water user group to include RDR or all other, those that have hydraulic connection, or is it actually a plan that actually is useless because it can't compel those to be become part of a water user group? Um, just wondering where it all, all sits. Now that you have uh, been involved in the process for quite a wee while and read the plan through and through, Bianca. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we can't compel, or Environment Canada, we can't compel people to join water user groups, but it's certainly going to help when people are on the same minimum flow to be able to move into water user groups, and the council will be quite supportive and probably quite encouraging of that, I would think. Uh, just, just one note on the... The um, RDR as well, um, I'm not sure if I should be saying this or not, but I will. Um, under the under the plan, and there's a there's an environmental flow and allocation table in, in section 13 of the land and water plan, and it 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 um, it has a, a different minimum flow for RDR, as I'm sure you're aware, but it also 
has uh, an allocation for an allocation limit for a, the A block and the the B block for RDR. And at the moment, their consent has all of the allocation, all of their consented allocation on the A block. So we've had some discussions with RDR about reviewing their consent to shift some of their allocation to the B block. Uh, and those discussions have been going well at this stage <coughs> to, to follow up with Tony McCormick to, um, to to see where things are at. But but that's one thing, just, just I suppose to make sure all the ducks are lined up in terms of what the plan anticipated is that um, that RDR's allocation is, is split as per the plan. Okay, thank you. Anyone, you got a question, Ange? Like Ange, sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. So my question is just at the end, we, we talk about the wellbeing component um, and you've highlighted COVID-19 and mycoplasma bovis. Um, it doesn't mention flooding and obviously for uh, each and every person up and down the river last year was a very significant event. Um, the financial impact was, um, was significant, um, but the emotional burden was equally so. So um, I, I'm hoping that there's acknowledgement and recognition of that in the process, uh, rather than just a just a paragraph at the end when they talk about that there's processes in place. Um, I, I'd, I'd hope that those processes can stand up when and if needed. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Angela. That uh, should have certainly been in the paper that that we circulated to you. I know after the the, the floods, the the major in floods last year. Um, we did get a, an email around those consent holders who were remaining, um, just pretty much saying we won't be in touch. We'll just let you get on with it and sort things out. Um, we 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 did certainly take the pressure off for quite some time, and particularly with for those consent holders who we knew were significantly impacted. Um, this was the last thing that they needed to deal with at this time. At that time, uh, yeah. So it has been a challenging. A challenging couple of years to try to be doing a consent review, given there have been so many other pressures on the rural community. Yeah, and so just if we look what's happening at the moment, and last week um, the ongoing vulnerability of the River Two and the ongoing stress that that generates. So full um, full recognition of the fact that you guys did back off, or however we want to term that. Um, but the problem hasn't sort of stopped or ceased for those that um, live with our rivers. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Hedger. Is there any other questions? Uh, Jen? Yeah, this is less a question and more of a comment relating to Chris's question just before. Um, I have to admit that I don't understand everything that you were talking about with the RDR and where the intakes are and those things, but just thinking that if we are looking at collaborative process that rather than um, an idea of compelling any organisations or people to have to do something, if there are processes we can go through to, um, to bring all the community and groups together in order to um, all be working towards what we want for the best outcomes for the river and the and the community and everything. And so rather than talking, yeah, rather than a compulsion kind of idea if there's something that we can do to just be talking to, to the RDR if that's what it takes. Thanks, thanks, Ted. Uh, Bianca, thanks. Ted. I think we're all getting a bit older. This process has <laughs> taken a while. Uh, we've been at it for a while, haven't we? We're all, but uh, you get to the end of it. It's, it's, it hasn't been easy. Um, we've been dealing with, you know. With two conflicts really, isn't it? Getting the water back into the river and, and obviously the farming community giving up consents and, and your staff have done a good job and trying to get the balance right and there won't be wins all the time but it's not easy I know so we do appreciate it and uh, we appreciate you updating and we'll keep uh, keep you updated. I will be interested on the Stockwater one, I've just been looking at my old records and it's been mentioned a few times so we'll just uh, look into that. Um, I think before we close, I think, James, have you got a quick question? Yeah, I just wanted, Bill, if we checked if anyone else online had any questions. No, they haven't checked. Is there is 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 a hand up there? What's that red line up there? Is there one there? At the top? Yeah. I'm not sure. You're going to you, James, is it? No. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. That's no, if, if not, then that's all good. Yeah, no, we have been keeping an eye on it, I think. Can you hear me or not? Yes, we can, Matt. Have you got a question? 
Oh, yeah, look, apologies, guys. Um, I've missed all the discussion. Um, <laughs> just the, just just on my way through the Linda's Pass, and they closed it. Um, <sighs> they opened it, so I've made a mad dash, but unfortunately, it means I've missed the uh, missed most of this meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, just just heard that summary, Bill. Um, and look, I, I agree that he kind of got a tremendously difficult job uh, with what they're doing. Um, but, you know, it, it, this may have been mentioned, but it's just really important for the committee to know that, 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 that absolutely it's a balancing job between, you know, the river and the community and the consent holders and what have you. Um, but it, it still should be about that balance. It does say that the um, the idea of putting in these low flows shouldn't adversely affect consent holders. Um, and that was the story that was, that was the messaging that the consent holders were given it, uh, not only during the course of the land and water plan, uh, but also uh, through the beginnings of this review process. Um, and for some people that's not come to pass. There are significant effects uh, for some consent holders. And, um, you know, looking at the plan and the messaging that has been given out, there was never the intention. Um, and, you know, we, we find ourselves in this position now. And, um, you know, socially there are some costs. Some people are taking a heavy burden um, of this. And it's just important that, uh, uh, you know, that the committee know that. I'm sure that many of you are already aware of that, but just thought, you know, with this being an agenda item that I would raise it. Bianca, do you want to comment on that at all? Oh, I, I probably just t totally agree with what Matt's saying. This is a, it's a very difficult, challenging process trying to, yeah, trying, trying, trying to get the balance. But um, and it is the case that some consent holders are being, you know, are being being seriously affected. It's, it's. I think it's difficult for for everybody involved. Yeah, I think yeah, we've learned a lot about this process and when we started and engaging with the community and, and uh, you know, you've got to believe the data that's given to you at the time and then things have changed a bit on some of the data, which has sort of made things a bit interesting. But we just watch with interest and I suppose it'll come to head a bit with the hearing ones because all that will come out. So watch it. So Chris, right. you can talk about the general process, eh? Hey? No, just, just, the, just the general process because Bianca, right at the very beginning there, one of the parts of your first slide, you talked about um, the effects, and then James asked the question about the legal advice. How do you balance up the two between the zone implementation plan saying X, the legal advice saying Y, and because I'm, it's for the greater zone committee here, what words actually mean the most? Is it legal advice or can the zip actually influence certain things because uh, to me it's just I just look at that and think that there's the probably the crux of the whole the whole problem really isn't it or the how you try and balance that up yeah and I suppose you know we've got we've got hard numbers in an operative regional plan which came through a community process including the, the zip um, and you know the reality is trying to implement this, those numbers means that there are considerable effects on on some people uh, and and that's where we sort of i suppose um you know i suppose looking to the to, to the legal advice to sort of guide us on on what the appropriate interpretation and way forward is there under the rma um yeah but then but then i suppose we've just sort of been trying to do it in a way that's given the consent holders enough time to get their heads around it trying to support them where we can to uh you know to help them look at alternatives and uh and that sort of thing and i and i hope uh, i hope that 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 people realize that we've been trying pretty hard on that front but um yeah you have uh, as, as so you'll know Chris, it's not easy yeah so so bianca just to follow on that question so that the hard numbers in a plan that you mentioned do, do they carry more weight than the narrative within the plan if those two things are at odds, there's a number. But is is it yeah more important than than the narrative? I think that would probably come down to the individual kind of circumstance of you know what the narrative is versus the the number. 
Yeah. And again, we'd probably, you know, for, we've been going back to the lawyers a bit on those sorts of questions. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Bianca, as I said, and Janine for your time, and uh, good luck, and we'll follow with interest. Um, right, David, what's next? I'm next. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have my uh, committee report. Uh, the first thing is that we had our uh, selection workshops in June for um, refreshing, and so we have two, we've selected two members, uh, and they will be ratified uh, by the councils in July, possibly into August. Um, I guess we can say who they are unofficially. Oh, what do you think? You happy? So the two incumbents, Bill and Jen, are, have been selected to come back on the committee. So we pretty much... <laughs> as long as the councils agree. Which yeah. <laughs> I'm sure won't be a problem. Um, second item on my report is just a summary of the spending, what we spent our budget on last year, our action plan budget. And we came in, spent it completely to the cent, so that was good. Um, this financial year that we've just... Just into now, we have another $50,000 um, for our action plan initiatives. And the next item there is just looking at our work programs through to the end of the year. So I'm proposing that in August uh, we have our election for the chair and deputy chair because we do to do that again. Um, we'll also be having uh, an update from, as Jude talked about, Otifarikai water quality data update. And we're hoping to also have a report from the Heinstein's Working Party recommendations. So that's a review of those recommendations where we've got to. So we're hoping that report will be ready for that meeting. Uh, and it would also be a good opportunity to start considering our action plan. Uh, is there anything we want to change? We produced the action plan a year or so ago. Um, and then looking at what we're looking at spending our money on um, for this coming year. Yeah. Noting that in September and October, as there will be local body elections, we won't be holding formal zone committee meetings, so we could still have workshops or field trips. And it's a possibility maybe Whakanui, Whakanui planting, maybe Jen, no, in September, perhaps? Possibly. 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 Oh. Yeah, yeah. David, James has got a question for you, I think. So, who, James. James. Oh, yeah. Sorry, James. got a question, yeah. This one, this one, yeah. I, um, Dave, the budget's 50000 for the coming year. I, somewhere in the back of my head, I had that as seventy five. <laughs> yes, uh, it was. Well, in the long-term plan, it was. Um, council had to make some difficult decisions around budgets this year, so um, Ian might want to talk to that. <laughs> no, 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 he doesn't. Um, so it was decided to, to keep it at 50k this year. Uh, the next item on the agenda after this item is um, Ali's going to talk about the Waitaha Action to Impact Fund, so there's another source of funding as well. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Ian? You will then. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was all spent on public transport. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, they've actually given it to someone else, so we'll, we'll be talking about that shortly coming up. Dave, just on the uh, August meeting, yeah. will you send out an updated sort of what our next priorities were, and then the committee can look at it and get information back to you if they want to th move something up around a bit, so when we have our meeting, yeah. you've got to get, the committee's got a chance if they want to bump something up or... Whether we should be contracting more on one year than the other, or just a bit yep. of feedback. I'll do, I'll do a paper for that meeting. That'll be great. Right. With on. a bit of notice. Yep. Can I just be. suggest that we be strategic about there's a volume of money that we're going to spend for the year, yeah. that we actually think about in advance what our priorities yeah. are, how we do it, rather than wait for a piecemeal coming in, and then, by the way, it's all gone on to something and we've actually yeah. missed other opportunities. Yeah. Totally agree. We might put totally a bit agree. of words around that. Cool. Yeah. Um, I just ask a question about his report. Yeah. Now, you, you talk about uh, you know, zone plan, yeah. and in minutes, uh, and I was a bit slow in raising it, you say Mount Harding Creek isn't a priority in our zone plan. I, I thought it was, in that we agreed that all tribute, that the Ashburton River and all its tributaries were part of our priority. And Mount Harding Creek, when we funded the project on it, was 
was considered a tributary of the Ashburton and therefore one of our priorities. And I'm not saying that makes any difference to our funding or anything else, but it just seems like a, it was a funny comment to have in the minutes. Yeah, probably, um, I think you made a good point. I probably didn't consider that um, that level of detail because we certainly have got that whole catchment as a, as a priority area. So I think that's the sort of thing we're really good to discuss as a group. How we how we refine those border priorities down to what we want to do in the next year, and that could be one of them. Yeah. Uh, Regional groundwater long term. Yeah. yeah so the net points four and five are, are just um, for your information reports that went to the Natural Environment Committee. Uh, so just for you to read, and if you want more information, there's some links there on those. I'm certainly no expert in those areas. That's my report. That's you. But, Bill, if I could just make further comment. It, to, to sort of sum up the, uh, the, the, the direction of where the zone committee might go, um, certainly in our annual plan process, uh, the future of uh, ECAN's financial commitment to the CWMS, for which the regional committee and the zone committees is the major part. Uh, was questioned, and it was considered that perhaps the new cap, the incoming council, uh, might consider reviewing that expenditure to try to make to to ensure that we're getting value for dollar. And clearly, this is an issue that we have to work with the district council with as well, because they're co co partners in this, or funders, or co whatever you call whatever we call ourselves. Very good friends, I think, is it? <laughs> or in America's case, very 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 good friends. Um, uh, but some of the discussions. Uh, that have been had is whether, in fact, we. Um, I think some of the critics of the zone committee process now is that you're administering. A, you know, there's quite a lot of um, bureaucracy for administering a fund of fifty thousand dollars a year um, on funding piecemeal biodiversity projects. Can you oh, close to the microphone. Sorry, um, piecemeal biodiversity product projects. Where we might be better to put that fifty thousand dollars into funding um, things, uh, initiatives like Angers catchment collectives, which is doing, which are doing, you know, widespread biodiversity projects across the district, and if perhaps the, we could streamline the process to, I mean, this is just one option to to put the funding into the catchment collectives, uh, so that Ange or her. Um, whoever else is doing the job can a uh, source other funding from other sources, whether it's MBI or MPI or whoever else is involved in funding those sorts of projects, but also doing that coordination of uh, uh, effort of encouraging and making sure that the projects are getting done out in, in the district, which then line up with the zone committee's aspirations for their action plan. And so that's that's sort of a uh, discussion that's been had with various zone committees across the region, and one that perhaps the, the zone committee might reflect on and perhaps come come in come in with an opinion on, which would be useful for uh, deliberations. Well, might not be my deliberations, but the, the new regional council's deliberations going forward. Well, thanks, Ian. Uh, my my opinion is that we're uh, we're here to, due to the courtesy of ADC and, and ECAN, so it's really if. If ADC and ECAN have a different view, well, they're the ones who are going to decide whether we stay or go. I, I, think, I think both, well, certainly from the regional council perspective, and I imagine the district council perspective, they'd be more than inclined to listen to the views of the zone committee. Well, I think, yeah, we definitely probably would. <laughs> but, um, just if you are going to have a wee look at it, perhaps we could have a look at um, Haranuris. Uh, they don't have a zone committee anymore, they've moved to another something. <laughs> and it might be worth just having a look at uh, what they do and see if um, it has any merit. Would it be fair to say who knew was dysfunctional? I, I don't know. <laughs> Which leads them, them yeah, doing they that. something else. Yeah. It might be good, it might not be, I don't know. Yeah. So we're a bit like turkeys, are we? <laughs> <laughs> right over Christmas. Uh, we've got a question, have we? Sydney, is it? Sydney and then Liz. Okay. Well, who's, well, Sydney. Sydney, Sydney first, then you, Liz. Oh, hi. Um, Two things can happen. I run out of battery or I don't know. Um, so if I cut off, is that because of that's what's happening? I don't have power for the whole afternoon, so I can charge my phone. But my question is about the long-term trends, 10-year trend and 30-year trend for groundwater. 
in uh, the Canterbury area report, who do we address questions about their report to? And would you have someone that's coming to talk to us about their report? Good question. It's a good question, Sidini. Um, I'll come back to you on the answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's just that it's... I just want to see how confident are they in making that statement because there are so many things they are not considered in their report and I just want to find out more. Okay, okay Liz. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, I'm one of the better critics on the, uh, the YDCWMS at the moment. Uh, I'm all for the CWMS, especially how when we started it up. And we went through um, the FMPs and the FEPs and all that, but I am one of the ones that said, well, we're paying uh, 70 something on thousand dollars on administrations and on Aurelium. At the moment, all we seem to be doing is just dribbling out $50,000 of each year money. We seem to have stagnated in most of the uh, um, C, um, uh, CWS um, areas, zones, and I think there is a, um, a good possibility that we need to really really look at what is our priorities. Are we giving the, um, the council, especially um, in our case, ADC, the other ones that uh, pay our honorarium and pay our expenses and stuff like that, are we giving them value for, um, for the bucks? And, and the same with every other zone across the uh, the Mohi. Uh, I, I think that we need to restructure completely. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as you're saying, Liz, things have changed a lot from when they, they were set up all those years ago. And I feel that's because of the direction we've probably had from, from ECAN more than anything, because they've, they've slowly taken away all the things we had. And so it's, up, it's whether they're going to uh, encourage us to go back a wee bit to how we were, or they want us to go in a different direction. That'll decide the things you say, but I think it's very relative, relative to what you said is, is correct. Yes, but uh, I, we, we did have our function uh, no, eight, nine years ago, and you know, even up to four years ago, that the function of helping to bring the FEPs in helping to bring the farm, uh, farm good farm practice uh, um, projects in. That, that was what the zippers and everything was all about. Now, the, I think the zippers are now uh, obsolete. So they've, been there, they've done their job and they've been and gone. We really have to really look at what is the function to see them in there going forward. Okay, yeah, well, Dave, you're going to have a bit of work ahead of you, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thanks, Thank Les, for that. Well, this will be interesting in our next speaker, which is Ali. Oh, um, oh sorry, sorry, sorry Jen. Um, I'm just wondering if you could enlarge perhaps on your comment just now about uh, if it can want us, us, the zone committee, to go back to how we were before. What did you mean by how well, we were? Before? What I meant was we used to have ECAN staff presenting to us and, and the, uh, the zone delivery teams, um, which we don't get very often now. You know, they had Janine Holland and uh, Livia. And so it was more, and then when we engaged in the Heinz uh, working party, we engaged with, with the community, um, the Ashburn Consent Review, we engaged with the community. But we appear to be left out of the the lakes now. They've they've told us, you know, we had a report today, but in the old days we would have had a, our hands a bit more dirty. So, as you say, they're telling us that their committees are operational and we have more management, but it, it just it just doesn't feel like that to me. So that's what I meant was we used to get our hands dirty and, and involved in it and could link the communities together. We right. just appear to be now. Sure, talk about 50 bucks. Yeah, 50K. my comment was going to be that there are lots of other things that we can do other yeah. than just give away money, yeah. um, and that perhaps those can be of as much or even more value. So, it I might agree, be if getting got into the community, do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so those are, yeah, I agree, Jen. If, you've got, if they give us things to do, we can do it. That's as you, uh, yeah, I agree. Can we? 
step up and take those things to do? Like, is that something well, that we can well, just we can go and get it, our yeah. hands dirty? Yeah. Because what part of my um, to what Jen... I was, was going to say, look, what Jen is saying is, what, what I was asking for is actually your opinion as to what useful roles the zone committees can play. Right. And I mean, I identified one, uh, and there may be others, but I think that, that feedback is not a question of sitting back waiting to be done to by some higher authority. It's a question of saying, actually, you know, we, we, we feel as if perhaps we're not serving as useful a purpose as we are, but these are the things we think we could add value to. Uh, a, the process of improving the environment and sustainability and getting stuff done in, the, in our district and advice to the regional council. So that's what, I, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and I agree with that. Um, before we have you, Andrew, we might just tidy up a bit of the backlog. Um, Ardy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, following the discussion we just had, I've been actually um, trying to reach out to the ECAN communication team for uh, several months now because we're supposed to be the community representative, but we don't have direct communication to the majority of the community. Not to mention most of the community probably don't know even that we exist from uh, the various talks that I had. And I believe that we should have our own uh, community outreach, um, which the simplest form of which would be a Facebook page managed by one or several members of the committee, and not only the main Canterbury uh, Facebook page that is currently done by ECAN. And I was wondering if we could have a representative of the ECAN communication team to discuss this thing at the August meeting. Certainly, Dave, we'll talk to that. We do. We have had ECAN communication people on our last field trip, and but yeah. you make a good point, Ali, and, and Dave will follow up on that. Um, Les, have you got a, you've got a question? Yeah, mine is uh, actually a comment to you, Bill. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we've been left at uh, too far as high. Um, I assure you that uh, there are two representatives from our zone committee even though we're not their zone committee members, if anything were to happen to affect the zone committee, um, both Arapati and myself would say, hold on, Taiho, that affects um, the zone committee and we'd be bringing it back. We are going to get our reports every six weeks to two months. So, I mean, if we've got to have to stop and say enough is enough on a working group, otherwise it gets too big and we don't get nothing done. Okay, Les, Les, appreciate that. Thank you for that. Um, Ange. Uh, so it just <coughs> leads on nicely to what's being discussed here, but I have half an email crafted today after we got the um, integrated plan email through from ECAM back on the 20th of July. So, so they're talking about integrated planning, and um, again, rather than wait for something to come down from above, I think with the knowledge that we've gained over, and we say 10 years, but it's longer than that now, isn't it? Yeah. So collective knowledge that we've got around the room and the wisdom that we've managed to pull together and that we have access to. And then we talked about some integrated planning for us in terms of what does good look like so we can sort of take the reins um, in conjunction with council and other things. But if we had a workshop on that um, and then we were able to feed into what ECAN are aspiring to do with their integrated plan, how can we be um, part of the solution? And instead of talking about communities which they often do, they're actually talking to the communities. So I see with September, October a bit vacant, um, and maybe that's an opportunity for us that we should be looking at. It's a very good idea. You reckon? Yeah, I cool. do. I think everyone would address all those questions. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we finish the meeting, but yes. Yeah. Yep, yeah. good point. Um, no more questions out there? Nothing there? Right, uh, so now it's... Jill, is it? Who's going to Ali? Ali. Talk about the Waitahard Action Plan. Are you there, Ali? Yeah, oh, yep, down Hi, Ali. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Kia ora. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I especially um, honour the fact that you are all there, considering what's going on in Ashburton. So good on you. Um, 
Uh, I, so I'm here to talk to you about the Waitaha Action to Impact Fund, which is a contestable fund that ECAN started last year. Um, I will assume that you've read the agenda paper, so I won't bore you with going back over the details in that. Um, there was just a few um, sort of key additional pieces of information that I thought you might like to know. Um, which was one of them was that um, what the paper didn't mention was that the people that applied last year to the to the fund were able to apply for up to three years of funding. Um, now we only allocated for year one because budgets were so uncertain and we didn't want to give people false expectations if you know when we weren't sure if the fund was going to continue. But upon receiving um, confirmation of the budget for this year, we have gone back to those successful applicants of la from last year that asked for multiple years and we've gone ahead and put run through the process with the panel and awarded um, those multi-year requests. So the one for Ashburton, for example, which was Bike Methven, um, in year one, so they put in a project to, to do some really major sycamore removal in their park and, and working with their adjacent um, neighbors and landowners around sycamore. Uh, starting to address the, the really significant sycamore infestation there. So um, in the first year, so the, which is um, the financial year that just ended, they received $10,000 and that was primarily to sort of get their plan of action going and, and, and get contractors on board, you know, and getting advice, et cetera. So this year, the they were awarded twenty thousand to go ahead and start getting the getting the project going, and then ten back to ten thousand for year three, um, and so that that's really good news for them. Claire has been made aware of that. The group has been made aware of that, and um, yeah, they were quite excited about that. Um, so the other. Thing um, I wanted to let you know. Sorry, I'm just looking at my. Uh, first of all, is there any questions about that or about the history well, of the Well, Annie, I'd like to butt in with a question fund? straight yeah. away. Um, so you have taken our extra. What well, we were we were going to get the seventy five thousand. We're now back to our fifty thousand, and you have given that money away to a, a good cause in Mid Canterbury which we as a zone committee could have done. So you've actually set up another committee using the funds that we're going to go to the zone committee. Is that correct or have I got that wrong? No, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's not quite that way. And I see Ian's there, so he, you know, he might have something well, to say. Well, he's smiling. <laughs> so yeah, the funding, it's fair to say um, Alice, Alison certainly hasn't taken any, anything away. She's doing what she's told to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm not involved with the, as Ian just said, with the, with how the budgets are determined. That's determined by the council. So I can't really address why one fund goes up and why one fund goes down. This is um, out of uh, general rates. It's not out. It's it's not out of the CWMS budget. So um, it is a different. It comes from regional leadership, and it it's a different part of the organization than the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. That's about as much information as I can give you on that. Um, it is a regional contestable um, fund, and it was set up in response to um, um, many requests and specific submissions that came through the long-term plan. <coughs> Um, from community organizations across the region. So that was that's the background on that. Um, uh, sorry, the other question we, yes, it is regionally. So um, while it looks like a lot of money, it's it's actually quite comparable to 
the zone action plan money when you look at it regionally. So that would be 500,000 regionally for zone action plan. And this one is 600,000. So they are quite comparable as far as amount of money goes. Um, sorry, I, that's about as, yeah, that's about as much as I can say around the inner workings of the budgets because I don't, you know, really play in that sandbox. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, have we got any questions? And just got one for you, um, Ellie. Yeah, I, I just think further to Bill's point, um, I think as a region, the more we can close the loop on what's happening here, um, and I know there's the Ashburton Biodiversity Working Group, so when, um, when we get lots of lif different little things going on and we don't have it um, working sort of cohesively, then it's not the best use of often everybody's time and resources. So when, um, for example, Bike Methan, I think you called it, um, it perhaps would have been good to notify the local zone committees that this funding had been allocated and maybe even get Bike Methan to come and present to the group so that we're all up to speed with what else is going on and we don't have to know every bun fight in town, but that's quite a significant one that, again, to me, the zone committee closes the loop on a lot of that activity. So um, it would have been a, a good collaborative chance for them to um, kind of meet us and, and get us a chance to meet them potentially, because that's quite significant funding. Um, so this year, uh, the, the um, fund has just opened. It opened um, on the 18th and it's open um, for eight weeks. So it's open until the 12th of September. Um, it's on our website and it's an online application process. Um, the, assess the assessment process, um, we go through a, ver a, a very extensive vetting process for the applications that are submitted. Um, so, and the, the high level areas that we look at are um, its alignment with council priorities, um, significance of the problem and opportunity, uh, the expected impact, value for money, project management, including leadership, financial, oh, including leadership and financial oversight, and the extent to which the community is likely to be involved. Um, so that, that vetting happens by staff, and then there's a, a panel that makes the decisions. I'm not on the panel. Um, it's a panel of senior management from across the organization. And again, this is run out of regional leadership portfolio. Um, and um, yeah, so that's sort of the process that we go through. We're trying to um, speed up the assessment process to get people their money by, before the end of the calendar year. That's our goal. Um, and I suppose one of the things I wanted to talk to the zone committee about is that there's an opportunity that, you know, the projects that aren't successful but are still, you know, vetted as being viable, good projects, um, because of course the money never, no matter how much money you have, it, it never goes far enough. Um, you know, is there an opportunity to uh, send those through to the zone committee if you would like to have a look at those um, as part of the consideration for your distribution for your fund? Um, yeah, last year we, it, it, the pilot year, it didn't, we wanted to, to do that, but we didn't quite have the right um, process. The, the timing didn't quite work out, but we're hoping to be able to do that better um, for this year. Thanks, Ali. There's a couple of questions for you. Um, Les has got a question, and then Adi. Yes, uh, Alison. It, I noticed in the criteria for that funding, there wasn't any Maharanga Māori in the months. Is that because mm -hmm. there are the funding for uh, Maharanga Kai and Fritz Patrick and a separate issue that mm -hmm. we... I don't know if anybody realised that there is that separate funding that uh, it is available to design committees as well. It's the mm -hmm. Maharanga Māori uh, mm -hmm. funding. 
Yes, that's correct, Les. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me of that topic. So we do have several different pots of funding. Um, and um, last year, for example, um, there was a couple projects that were put forward for the Waitaha Action to Impact Fund, which were um, initiated by, uh, by uh, Runanga, and those were successfully transferred over to the to the fund, the other fund, and they were funded through that fund. So, uh, and that's the other thing, I guess it's kind of this process. I mean, because the Y fund is a process really more than anything. And there's also, op and it's an opportunity as a sort of a clearing house, if you will, of projects that are, are vetted and, and, and can go then to other places for consideration, that being one of them. Thank you for reminding me of that. Thanks, please. Um, Adi? Thank you. I was wondering if there are any guidelines or consideration in terms of how money is allocated to projects um, to different areas within the region, because the Waita region is huge. And I, for example, I've noticed that the Christchurch uh, West Melton allocation for Project Last it was around $100,000, while for the Methven or Mid Canterbury, it was ten thousand dollars. So, mm. is there a criteria to try to allocate the money more evenly among the different areas within the region? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, so, it's not one of the assessment criteria. Um, projects are assessed on merit of the project. Um, but that being said, we we do. Last year, we did pay attention to that and, and try to, um, uh, you know, projects that that had, you know, met the criteria, um, we tried to, to, to take into consideration uh, their location. Um, but it's not a distribution, it's not a, you know, it's different than the, the zone committee action funding, which is specific amounts for specific it parts of the region. It's it is a region wide fund. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor Wilson. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bill. My question: Can district councils and zone committees themselves apply? Um, no. <laughs> is the short answer to that: You must be a um, a charitable okay. trust or an incorporated society. But I, you know, you were talking earlier about your Mid Canterbury. Uh, trust and and they they could apply because from my understanding they are in an either an incorporated society or a charitable trust they could also function as an umbrella organization for other smaller groups that may not be um at that level so they could put in a, an application for you know multiple projects and support smaller groups as well thank you uh jen Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about the comments that have been made by the Zone Committee about um, our loss of, of money and that it's gone somewhere else and, and kind of wanting to be informed about what's going on. And I'm wondering if there's something that we can do to um, bring the community in to be able to, like, to have some incentive for them to talk to us about things. The reason I'm thinking is that the Y Fund is something that my organisation is going to be applying for and I wouldn't really have considered coming to the Zone Committee to tell them about my application. But I'm wondering if the Zone Committee needs to have something um, like a, an area-wide idea of what Kiuta Kitai actually looks like so that we can get these groups who are, you know, trying to do different things to fit into something that is a sort of regional plan that we can, everybody can look at and, and figure out where they fit into that and what could be done in order to do that. Is there something like that yet or? Well, there's not yet and I think it's a good point we can discuss about yeah. what we want yeah, to do at the workshop. It's a good idea. In definitely if fits oh. in. Yeah, and, and I, I can tell you there, so in the Y Fund, there is a question about who are you partnering with and who, who you know, and, and so there's an opportunity there. Also, last year, several of the 
um, groups um, that applied uh, submitted letters of support from the zone committees. Okay. Yeah, I think Jen and Ange both made the same point in a different way, and that we, you need some sort of level of coordination. It would be nice if, as part of the criteria, Alison, um, but when you're working through the criteria in terms of priorities for the regional council, uh, if the regional council took some advice from the zone committees as to what their priorities are, so that there is some alignment between the zone committee's priorities, and, and this zone committee has some clear priorities in terms of the Ashburton and Hines rivers and their tributaries. And so if projects mm -hmm. that come to this fund for as an application yeah. tick those boxes, then that's yeah. uh, an additional tick, perhaps. I mean, I, I think that's something worth considering that. The way I'm yeah. Describing. So, so part of that vetting, you know, I mentioned earlier that we we put the um, we vet the projects with staff. So part of the vetting is that it does go to the zone <coughs> delivery team, and we ask them about alignment with the zone um, action plans and the priority areas in their zones. So we that that is part of the information package that get that goes to the panel. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, Ali, that's, it's been interesting. Thank you. And, and I think we've got a better understanding of what you're doing. There's probably not quite the conflict I thought. It might be just a bit different. And I think we can certainly work together, which would be good. That's great. I'm very encouraged to hear we'll be getting some more applications from um, the Ashburton <laughs> Uh, zone as well. That's, That's encouraging. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and hey, email me anytime if you have other questions. Well, except the next 10 days because I'm in Raritana. <laughs> but after that, you know, if you have any questions, just give me a, an email. I hope your bungalow's not on the beach. I hope it's up, up land a bit further. I'm a little worried. It's <laughs> easy to go for a swim. We'll be all right. You'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's Bye. Fine. That's good. So other business. Well, yes. A brief comment about applying. Um, and Les touched on it really when he said that there seemed to be a lot of applications or successful applications out of the Christchurch West Melton area. And that's because a lot of those groups are quite uh, well established trusts with quite a professional yeah. attitude to applying for money and they uh, lobby the regional council quite successfully in terms of how, how what a great job they're doing and doing stuff and so that's not to say we, we you know Ashburton shouldn't should be a poor cousin to that but I think we just need to think about how when you're yeah. applying you lift your game in terms of your presentations and your applications so that you you're competing with some of these groups that are pretty professional I've got a lot of political support for their position is it feasible because the catchment groups are now set up an entity as a trust uh, for example, if, if Jen wanted some money for Wakanui, could could she yeah. work with Angela for the trust to get the application through? Is that feasible? That's that, that, that sounded like very good advice from Alison, as far yeah. as I can see. Yeah. That's good. We're going to finish in 10 minutes. Oh, we always finish at 3, Chris. It's got a meaning Of course you have on TV, is it? <laughs> All right. Um, so, David, you might just explain a bit. We've had an idea about a workshop about the Zone Committee putting their own ideas of how we can move forward and in a different way or get a structure right. Have you got, have you, well, have you got an idea about how you'd like to do that? It's on the fly. <laughs> That's what um, we like. But just thinking about a few things there. So, we have this action plan that we've agreed on. And we need to have a little look at the priorities in that. Are they still what we want to do? Yeah. Um, there's... Um, this idea that, that that Jen brought up about, um, you know, how can we get a better grip on what's going on in the zone? There's nothing to say that we can't use our action plan budget to do stuff in that area. We don't have to spend it on planting. We might, for instance, hold a community workshop and bring people in to to, um, to get something going like that. And Angela's probably done quite a bit of that stuff already, but those are the sort of things we could talk about in the workshop. I think what might be useful is if people perhaps email me ideas of things they'd like to discuss um, and then we can get some get some preparation work done beforehand. We could have a, a short meeting in August to yep. do the formalities and then go into a workshop, perhaps a closed workshop where we're free to just, you know, shoot the breeze with what we want what we think we want to do. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how we can feedback up to the councils 
than you can about where we think the zone committee is going to go or should go. Maybe we can use the time for that as well. Good. So if they're happy to have a shorter meeting in August and then go into the workshop rather than wait till September, October. Should we just get on with this, do you think? And can the district council bring some of their perspective as well? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, so on the 18th of August, the Ashburton Biodiversity Working Group meet for a second time. They've already had an initial workshop, but now they've sent out a survey and they're coming back to meet on the 18th. So there's nothing to say that some outcomes of that meeting can't be fed into this one, because I think it's very relative to each yeah. other. Brilliant. Yep. Cool. And do you want members to send you an email with their, their view of what we should be doing, or would you just sort of do it on the meeting? How do you feel? Well, whatever people can send to me beforehand means I can be a lot better prepared yeah. and we can circulate the information. So, yeah, any ideas, let's get them to me and we'll take it from there. So is everyone happy if we do that in August? Or they we might as well... Well, we can, at least we can start it in August, yeah. even if we have to continue to September, October, we can get the ball rolling. OK. Yeah. Yep. 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 Do something. Yeah. Do yeah. And while we can't have official meetings, we might as well use the time to for brainstorming or whatever. Yeah. There'll be no campaigning, though, will there? No. <laughs> no campaigning. <laughs> Okay, so before we close, is there any other comments or uh, business or anything anyone wants to bring up? Can I just yeah. say quickly, um, so I think it was earlier this month, whatever month we're in, um, we had a local farm that took out the Supreme Award for the Balance Farm Environment Awards, Flemington Farm, mm. and, um, and I think that was, you know, often as we can we punch above our weight in a lot of different aspects, and um, that was a, that, that whole evening was a celebration on... Um, on farming, and it was just a really collaborative type of awards with um, ECAN and with lots of different organisations involved. So I uh, just wanted to raise that. That's good. And I know they are tying in with the Year 12 Ag students at Ashburton College to, um, you know, to do some of that knowledge sharing of what that farmer had to do to achieve that Supreme Award and and share that with the, the up-and-coming students. So I thought that was um, that's quite positive. That's good. Thanks for that, end. Okay, well, uh, Dave, will you close the meeting, please? Uni here, uni here, uni here, ki te uru tapanui o tane, ki awatia, ki a mama, te nako, te tinana, te wairua, i te ara takata, ko ara e rongo, whakaaria aki ki wonga, ki a tina, tina, homie, huie, tai, ki e. Well done, Dave. Thank you.